My name is Marty Schock, and today I'm going to talk about building a high-performance key-value store in Go. And this talk really is the story, not just of what we built, but also why we made the decisions we did and how the process we followed helped us get to a successful outcome. Like many stories, ours starts with a problem. And the particular problem we were facing looks like this. We have a primary data source. You can think of that as your application's database. And anytime there's a change, we get a notification on this feed. And our purpose here is to consume that feed and build an index. And the purpose of that index is so we can answer search queries. And this relates to this talk because architecturally, that black box of an, in box of an index is implemented as a key value store. And so now our situation we find ourselves in is finding the right key value store that's going to let us meet these goals. So before we go any further, what is a key value store? First, the keys and bytes are just, keys and values are just slices of bytes, right? This is that lowest level thing we can serialize anything down into bytes. And on those bytes, we have certain operations we can perform. We want to be able to get, set, and delete a value by its key. So with the data set you see here, the get operation on the key header is going to return the value mad. The set operation on the key rabbit with a new value of late, which is now going to replace the previous value, which was early. And the delete on the key head is going to remove the key value pair, head, and attached. Many key value stores are ordered. And when they're ordered, we expect them to offer an operation where we can iterate through ranges of key value pairs. So in this case, we would see hatter, mad, followed by rabbit, late. Another really nice property is the ability to have atomic batch updates. And what we mean here is that the application can independently prepare a set of changes and have them all take effect at once. And anyone reading the database, they would either see all those changes or none of those changes. It's a useful primitive upon which we can build some higher level functionality. And related but different is this notion of isolated read snapshots. Right? We want to be able to get a view of this key value store at a point in time and hold on to that independent of other changes going on. So here, if I were to create a snapshot and start an iterator from that, I would first see the key value pair cat and grinning. But concurrent with that, someone else has made some other change. And even if that's done in an atomic batch, that new key value pair of caterpillar smoking is going to be in the KV store. But that's shielded from us on this particular isolated read snapshot. The next key value pair we see is still hair and march. And finally, we might take it for granted, but we want this key value store to be able to be persisted to disk. This is going to allow us to do two things. One is, if our application crashes or just needs to exit for any reason, we don't want to start over again if we don't have to. But second, we want to work with data sets that maybe are larger than the amount of RAM we have, right? So we need to be able to spill that out to disk as well. So that's what we're looking at. But you're probably wondering, did we consider any off-the-shelf solutions? There's a lot of key value stores out there. One of the first ones you might consider in the Go community is BoltDB. It's been around for a number of years now. I've used it successfully in a number of projects. Internally, it's implemented as a B plus tree, which generally means it's going to offer really good read performance once you've got that structure built. But the challenge you may find is getting that structure built and keeping it built. Right? It turns out that wasn't going to be such a good fit for us with our use case. Another one you might consider is RocksDB. It's very popular in the C, C++ community. And again, if you're in that community, I'd strongly suggest you look at RocksDB. Internally, it's using what's called an LSM, which goes back to its roots from the LevelDB project. Generally, the LSM is going to give us a better balance between the write performance and the read performance. But we're in the Go community. So using a C++ library like this means we would have to use CGO. And we know with CGO, there's a small price to be paid every time we cross that CGO boundary. It turns out when we're writing data, we're frequently going to do batches anyway, so we can amortize that cost across the size of the batch. And that works well for writing. But it doesn't work, work quite so well when you're reading data back out. You're forced to either read a bunch of data and throw it across that boundary, even if you don't care about it. Or you're forced to push your logic to the other side of the boundary, and now you're maintaining more and more of a C++ application. So RocksDB just wasn't a great fit for us either. There's also Go level to be. This is, again, a more pure port of LevelDB into Go. And so that means it's also an LSM, again, traced to its roots in LevelDB. 
And so you would think this is probably a better fit for us, right? It's got all the benefits, but it doesn't have that CGO cost. But unfortunately, even when we tried tuning the various parameters in this, we still weren't able to meet the objectives we wanted to. So we had to keep looking. And many of you in this room have heard of Badger. This was just announced just a few months ago. And it's exciting. Uh, it's based on a technology called WhiskKey internally. But unfortunately, it just wasn't available at the time we did this evaluation. So it's something we're excited about. We like seeing competition in this space. But it just wasn't available for us at the time. And so this left us asking ourselves the question, are we really about to build our own key value store? Right? This is not something we take lightly. We, we've already discussed there's some performance concerns. So we're going to have to face some performance challenges. Uh, and it's also kind of a low-level system component. No one wants to go to their boss and say, yeah, we lost the customer's data. And the reason is it's because of that key value store I wrote a few months ago. Right? No one wants to be in that boat. So if we're going to do this, we've got to make sure we're setting ourselves up for success. So we want to think about some principles behind this. The first is the notion of simplicity. It's something we talk a lot about in the Go community. And it, that's, of course, because it's one of the core tenets of the language itself. I was heavily influenced by a talk given by Damian Grisky uh, called Slices, Performance Through Cash Friendliness. And slices are a topic you'll see, uh, it's a theme you'll see throughout this talk. They're used quite a bit. But in particular, there's a note he pulled out at the end. This is from Rob Pike, Notes on C Programming. And I bolted the sentence at the end. Use simple algorithms as well as simple data structures. This is something on this project we're going to embrace wholeheartedly. Whenever we're faced with a new problem to be solved, we're going to first ask ourselves, what's the simplest thing we can do? Which is going to come back to simple algorithms and simple data structures. And also on the topic of simplicity, there's a talk given by Dave Cheney, Simplicity and Collaboration. And the quote I've extracted here is, simplicity cannot be added later. So if we're going to achieve our end goal of having simplicity, it's because we focus on it from the very beginning. You can't just hack it in. And the second major thing we're going to think about as we prepare for this implementation is, we're going to be really explicit. We're setting out to build a special purpose key value store, not the next best general purpose key value store. Right? We're going to focus, that's why I pulled up our use case again, we're going to focus on this particular use case and make sure whatever decisions we make are the right ones for what we're building. And by doing that, we, we see a couple more properties emerge. The first is that data source could potentially be very high volume. And so one of our goals up front is we need to keep up with that feed to the extent possible. And to do that, we need to be able to achieve a high write throughput to keep up with that source feed. And the second is a property I call read after write latency. And I'm calling it that just to differentiate it from a pure read latency. It's not just how fast can we read out of this index. It's how long does it take from the time a change is first present on that feed on the left-hand side until it's visible in an actual search result on the right-hand side. Oftentimes, throughput and latency are at odds when you're optimizing things. right? So we want to be very clear that both of these metrics are ones that are important, are important to us. And it leads to a couple other implications. The first is that we can think about this and realize that persistence is actually decoupled from both the read and the write path. And what I mean by that is we want to persist this to disk as we go, right? We don't want to have to redo a bunch of work if our process crashes or we have to start over. But it's not actually tied to the success of the write operation itself. We're going to consider a write successful as soon as we've updated whatever structures we have in RAM, and we'll persist it eventually. And likewise, on the read side, we're not going to wait for things to get into disk before we serve them up in search results. Again, that, that once it's in memory and index, that's, that's the data structure. And related to that, we're very willing to use all the system RAM to do this. right? And I, I point that out in contrast to a system where you might be configuring a buffer cache of 64 megs or a gigabyte. right? We're quite happy to throw 32 gigs, 64 gigs, whatever it is, to meet these other objectives. So we're going to be very memory friendly, try and use as much as we can to meet these objectives. And so that's the backdrop, right? That's the context. That's how we're going to approach this particular problem. We're now ready to start looking at the actual implementation. So to start, we're going to consider an interface we call collection. Collection represents the key, the key value store as a whole. And we're already going to see our first simplification. Previously, we talked about doing sets and deletes, as well as having batches. The first simplification is we're going to have a rule. All the writes in the system are going to go through a batch. Right? It limits the way you use the system, but it simplifies our first implementation. And the second simplification is we're going to do the same with reads. We're not going to allow you to do one-off gets or iterators. We're going to require you to first get a snapshot. 
And so by having those two simplifications, we see our API is much more streamlined. All the writes go through the batch, and all the reads come out of a snapshot. So let's look a little closer at the batch. It has two methods, set, the key and the value, both slice of bytes, and a delete, which just takes a key. So now let's think about how an application would build up a batch, right? We're going to represent a batch with a rectangle. And as applications are building up batches, I'm only showing the keys here at the moment, Alice, Dodo, Nave, Cat, and so on. Right? These are all just coming in in no particular order. But now let's think about it again. Let's, let's say, let's simplify it. Let's imagine this data set you see here is the entire data set. How would we implement the read side on this data? The reads are going to come out of this snapshot interface, which means we need to be able to support a get operation and an iterator. So again, this is our data set. I've changed the presentation of it slightly just to emphasize that, again, the keys were added in the batch in no particular order. So what if we instead thought of these batches of changes as simply appending to a slice every time a new operation happens? Now, we could simply sort those keys. And by sorting the keys, we now recognize that the get method can be implemented just by doing a binary search for that key. We're simply going to start in the middle, jump around until we either find the KV pair or not. So the get operation is very simple in this model. What about iterating a range of keys? We can actually observe that's a straightforward extension, right? We're going to do that same binary search to find the start key. And now we can iterate over successive keys by just using a for loop and just iterating through them. So at this point, we can step back and realize, make an observation. This object we've been talking, talking about called a batch, right? It's unsorted, because applications build batches in whatever order they want. And it's obviously mutable, right? You keep adding things to a batch. But at a certain point, you're going to hand that over to us and execute it. And at that point, we're going to, one, declare it immutable from that point forward. And second, we're going to sort it. And when we sort it, we're going to represent it now with a triangle and call that a segment. So there's this notion of a batch and a segment, which are really just two facets of the same underlying structure. And we're going to implement it like you see here. It's using slices, just like I said, but maybe not the slices you were thinking of. You might have been expecting a slice of keys and a slice of values. But instead, we have two slices, one called data, which is a slice of bytes, and one called meta, a slice of uint 64s. So let's look at how we would use this particular implementation. So now we're looking at the set method, right? This is the, the key came in as the key name, and the value is Marty. And let's imagine our data slice. It already has 20 bytes from previous operations. The first thing we're going to do is append our new key and value to that slice. So first we append name, and then we append Marty. Now we're going to build up two uint 64s worth of metadata describing the operation we just performed. So that first uint 64 we devote entirely to the offset. Again, there were already 20 bytes of data from previous operations. So this operation starts at offset 20. We record that. And again, we're devoting a full 64 bits to that. Now we're going to record the operation. We know we need to support at least sets and deletes. There could be more in the future. So we're going to indicate that with an S. And we're going to give four bits to that. Now we also want to record the key length. Again, the key was name, has a length of four, so we record four. And we have 24 bits set aside for the key length. And finally, the value length. Again, the value was Marty, has a length of five. We record five, and we have 28 bits for that purpose. And that leaves us eight bits left over, which we've just reserved for future use. So now we have those two uint 64s. We're going to append those to the metadata slice. So again, there's two slices, one of data and one of metadata. And again, you still might be wondering, OK, I see how that works, but why this particular structure? One big advantage to this is now, when we're doing the sorting, we only have to shuffle around the integers describing those positions. So if we had larger keys and values, which might be large slices of bytes, we don't have to move those around to perform this sort. We can just shuffle the integers around. And now if we take a step back, we can see this interface, this structure we've been looking at actually implements a number of the interfaces we've already been talking about. We already saw how it could be used to implement the set and delete. Those are just going to be appends to this slice. We saw how it could implement the snapshot through the gets, with which would be a binary search, and the iterators. And again, in this very simple world, we're saying that one batch, that is the entire collection. So we've actually implemented a collection as a whole as well. But of course, this very first iteration, it doesn't look much like a real KV store yet, right? It only has one batch of data, so it's not particularly useful yet. So we need to 
enhance it to now consume a second batch. And we're going to do that by introducing now a stack of segments. In Go, a stack is implemented just using a slice. In our case, it's a slice of pointers to segments. So again, we had that first se uh, sorry, segment from the previous version. Now we've got our next incoming batch. The first thing we'll do is sort that in place. I'm specifically calling out that we're sorting it in place because we're not holding any other locks in the system at the moment. And that sorting itself can even be done on the call and go routine. Once it's sorted, we're going to represent that now with a triangle. We're going to acquire a lock and simply push this onto the top of the stack and release the lock. So again, the critical section was very small. It was just long enough for us to append that new segment onto the stack of segments. So now we have a stack of segments, not just a single segment. How are we going to implement the get method on top of this? Well, we already saw we can do a binary search on an individual segment to search it. And we know that now that as newer data is coming in, that's going to be at the top of the stack. So we can simply start by doing a binary search at the top element in the stack and work our way down. If we don't find it, we go down to the next one, and so on. In this case, maybe we find it on that last segment. That's the KV pair, which will be returned to the application. So gets are a pretty straightforward e extension to what we saw before. What about the iterators? Turns out it's going to be a little bit trickier. But we don't have to add a lot of code because we're going to use the standard library. Right? It provides something called the container heap package. And we're going to use that to help us implement the behavior we want. So again, our stack has three segments. I've shaded them different colors of gray here so you can keep track of which ones are which. The circles correspond to the iterator for each individual segment. Again, that's just doing the binary search and the for loop like we talked about earlier. And once we have those iterators, the text in the circle is what that iterator is currently pointing to. Right? So that's the key that the, that individual iterator is seeing. Once we have those three, we're going to place those into the heap. This particular implementation of a heap is a min heap. So that means if we're sorting them by the key that they're currently seeing, the next lowest key will be at the top of that heap. And so now, by simply taking that top iterator, returning that key Alice, that's now the first key our iterator is going to return. Now, that iterator got advanced. It's now pointing at Dodo. And so you're probably thinking, well, now it's no longer in heap order, but we can now use the heap fix method to reestablish the correct ordering within the heap. And now we know that the next key that should be returned by our iterator is going to be cat. And so we can just keep repeating this process as we go through all the iterators and ultimately iterate through all the KV pairs in the collection. Now, when we looked at the requirements, we wanted to have atomic batches. And in that first version, there was only a single batch, so it didn't even really make sense. But now we have multiple batches which come into the system. How are we going to ensure we have atomic batches? Well, it turns out we kind of get those for free here as well. We know that the batches are immutable once we declare them as segments. Uh, and we're going to have this lock which we honor whenever we're making changes to that stack. So anyone looking at that stack is going to get a consistent view of a bunch of segments. And you'd, there's just no possible way you'd see a partial batch in this design. How about snapshots? Again, we talked about having the ability to have a, a, a sort of a point in time view of the key value store. So we know that the, the collection itself is the segment stack. Again, what if we lock it, create a copy of that stack, and release the lock? And I want to be clear, we're only copying the stack of pointers. In this case, there were just three pointers that needed to be copied. We did not have to copy the underlying data for those segments. And that's safe because, again, even though we just have a pointer to that structure, We've already declared them immutable. We're not going to allow any other changes to them. So now that we have this snapshot segment stack, we can keep working with that. Meanwhile, once we've released that lock, right, additional changes are happening, additional content's coming in. And so that collection segment stack changes, but our snapshot is safe and stable. So now we've extended the design. We can handle more batches coming in. But some of you have probably seen a problem. right? There's a stack. And that stack is just going to keep growing taller and taller. And that's ultimately going to hurt our read performance. So we need to introduce something to the design. And we're going to start with something we call a background merger. But the cool thing is, again, we can use largely functionality we've already built to do this. We know the stack is getting too tall. In this case, our stack has a height of 4. We've already seen how we can iterate through multiple segments. And we're going to actually use that functionality again. We're going to create an iterator for the bottom three segments. And as we traverse that iterator, we use it to build up a new one. It's larger in the sense that it contains the data of those three segments, but it can deduplicate any key value pairs where there are you know, 
the similar piece. And of course, there's less overhead in having a single segment instead of three. So now once we've finished building up that new segment, we can simply again acquire a lock, swap in this new segment for those other three, and release the lock. So now, again, our stack height was four. It's now down to two. So we have this ongoing background merger, which can keep the height of that stack in check. So it's looking better now. We get more batches coming in. They behave atomically. We can do all the reads we want. Um, we're not worried about the stack height growing, but we still have a problem. Right? We haven't talked at all about persistence to disk. So we're going to try and tr you know, start simple again. And that's going to start with what we call an append-only file format. If you're not familiar with it, it's exactly like it sounds like. We're literally only going to write data to the end of the file. First, that's simple. right? We never have to think about seeking through a file. We don't have to worry about do we have to decide to update this value or not. It's always new data, and it's always at the end. And it's also safe. I want to be really careful here. When you talk about safety in file systems, there's a lot to you have to worry about. But it's safe from one perspective, which is if, we've already, if we can assume we ever write it out correctly once, we know that a subsequent update's not going to like, you know, corrupt that in any way. Uh, so it has an element of safety, which we'll see applied in the coming slides. But first, let's look a little deeper at the actual file format. It starts with a header, which just has a version number and some other things, so we can change the format in the future. Now we need to persist each segment that's in that segment stack. And again, that segment is represented by those two slices we saw. I've included the method signature here of the file write method, so you can see that it works with bytes. So the data is going to be easy, right? We've already got data in the right format. It's bytes. We just pass that to the right call. But what about the UN64s? You might be thinking, we need some sort of encoding here. And you're probably right. But in this very first version, we're going to cheat. We're going to use the unsafe package, which I generally don't recommend, but this was the decision we made. We're going to use the unsafe package to basically acknowledge, like, we know those UN64s, they are just a bunch of bytes in the computer. Let's just cheat and get access to them. And that works because that lets us now take that slice and just use the file write method to write out the contents. We have to, of course, acknowledge, right? We know up front this is not portable. We're now dependent on the byte order of this machine. But we'll circle back and talk about that a little later. Once we've written out the segments, we're going to write out a footer. And this is analogous to the stack, right? The stack had pointers to segments. The footer is going to have pointers to the segments on disk. So it plays that same role. Of course, that's a very simple and a real application. More and more segments coming in. We're at another footer. And again, we just want to highlight that new footer, it can continue to point not just to the two new segments, but it can continue to point to that older segment that was also written out. Right? There's no need for us to copy that over again. We can keep pointing to it in this file. So that's how we write out the data. How do we open this up and work with it again? Like many append-only files, we generally start at the end of the file. And what we do is we seek backwards from the end towards the beginning. And we're looking for the start of a valid footer. If we find it, as we did here, that last footer would be the one we'd open up and proceed from that point forward. But we talked earlier about safety. So what would happen if our application had crashed before it had written out the valid footer? In that case, this process is going to seek past that invalid footer and proceed to the first valid footer that it finds. So from that point forward, yes, we would have lost some of the data that hadn't been persisted out. But the important thing is we didn't corrupt the whole file, right? We still have a valid file from where we can pick up and keep going. Now, that's just talking about opening the file. How do we work with the data that we've written inside of the file? And to do that, we're going to leverage a system call. It's a very powerful system call called memory map, or mmap. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, what it lets us do is take a file or a section of a file on disk and map that to a slice of bytes in Go. I've depicted it here uh, with the brain representing the operating system because it's important to know it doesn't just take the contents and read it all in, right? Instead, it's establishing the mapping. So now on demand, when we access this memory, this byte slice, the operating system is in charge of fetching it when necessary, caching it when necessary, deciding how long to keep it in cache, and so on. So it's a simplification from our project's perspective, right? Because we're getting a lot of behavior for free, but we're deferring a lot of that now to the operating system. It's also worth mentioning that slice of bytes for the metadata, we have to do that unsafe trick in reverse again. So now we can pretend that that's a slice of UN64s again. And if it's not clear what this really means, it means that in memory and on disk segments are exactly the same. We don't have to write any new code to 
do a get implementation or an iterator implementation. And the reason is, to our project, they just all look like slices of bytes. I've illustrated a sample here where you see this collection segment stack, the top segment, is, its slice of bytes has just been allocated in Go, just came in through a RAM. But that second, uh, second segment in the stack, its slices of bytes have been memory mapped from disk. But again, our code base doesn't know that. It doesn't have to understand the difference. We get all this behavior for free. But there's another problem. Just like before, we had the stack of segments which grew too tall, we now have a file on disk which is just going to grow forever. So we need to introduce some notion of compaction. But again, we can turn to the fact that we can reuse functionality we've already built. Okay, we saw how we could use that background merger to merge multiple segments into one. We can do the same thing here. Here we have a file where there's, in this case, three segments and two footers. We can reuse that iterator logic we saw before, create a new file, create a single segment. Again, it's going to be smaller. It's deduplicating some of the common data. It's got less overhead because there's just a single segment. And now we can write out that footer. And this new file has the entirely equivalent data of the first file in a smaller footprint. And so now we can remove that original file and keep going. So you see at several steps in this process, we've started with this very simple implementation. And that's allowed us to get something working and keep going. And so we've actually met all the initial requirements we set out for this key value store. And so it's fair at this point to step back and say, you know, what is this thing that we've built? And this is something we call MOS. MOS stands for Memory Oriented Sorted Segments. And it's a project that's up on GitHub today. It has a relatively long list of features, many of which we've covered, but some of which we don't have time to go into. And it's distributed under the Apache 2.0 license. Uh, so it's a relatively permissive license uh, if you're interested in this type of technology. It's, in my opinion, a very approachable code base. And I choose the word approachable carefully. It's not an easy code base. Uh, key value stores, uh, they have wrinkles. You have to worry about file systems and things. So there's some complex corners to it. But it's approachable for the simplicity we've been talking about up till now. It's just over 4,000 lines. Uh, and like many low-level components, it actually has more of its code devoted to tests than it does to the implementation itself. Now, the title of the talk called out high performance. Uh, and so it's fair for us to take a look back and see you know, what, what elements or aspects of this design relate to the performance. And the first has to do with the garbage collector. Uh, if you've ever tried to write high performance code in Go, you've at some point interacted with the garbage collector and had to give some thought to it. So if we look at the segment structure, the first observation we can make is we're working with slices that are just uint 64s and bytes, right? And these are both scalar values in Go. And so what that means is even though these slices themselves may get quite large, the garbage collector just has to look and see if that particular slice is still needed or not. It doesn't have to go into the contents of the slice itself. So that's going to help. Next, and related to that, we had this notion that in the metadata slice, right, we're using integers, integer offsets as pointers, not actual pointers in the Go language itself. And so what this means, again, is unlike a structure, a list structure, uh, you know, a B tree or something, right? anything with nodes and pointers to nodes tends to have a lot of pointers, all of which the garbage collector has to consider. And this design avoids some of that. The next has to do with memory, but a different side of it. This is the allocation side. And so again, if we look at that segment structure, we can make some observations. We know we need exactly two uints worth of metadata for each operation. And we know that the length of the data is equal to just the length of the keys plus the length of the values. And so what that means is we could introduce a more advanced API. Right? Many applications will know how many operations they have and the size of the data. If they can pass that along to us, we can make sure that data is all allocated in a single call, avoiding a bunch of extra calls to the allocator. Once we do that, again, earlier we'd seen there was a set and a delete method. We have companion methods, which are called alloc set and alloc del. They have the exact same signature, but the contract is they're working with that pre-allocated chunk of RAM. And so again, if we use this, we're making fewer calls into the allocator, and we're also helping with fragmentation as well, because we'll be getting larger chunks of contiguous space. Now, I mentioned our use of unsafe earlier. I wanted to come back to that. It does, in the moment, achieve a slightly faster serialization at, of course, the expense of portability. Uh, but I personally found this decision deeply unsatisfying. Uh, Rob Pike has a blog post, the byte order fallacy. And the quote is, whenever I see code that asks what the native byte order is, it's almost certain the code is either wrong or misguided. And it points out 
like it's not just that we're using unsafe, but we're using unsafe in a particular way that now ties us to the byte order of the machine we're on. It's kind of hard to escape this. It's all, all we can do, we do at this point and say, you know, this is, this is a, something our project has to own for now, and we have to look at trying to fix it in the future. And of course, you can't talk about performance if you don't talk a little bit about benchmarks. And oftentimes when you're looking at benchmarks, you're looking at tables of numbers. Uh, and that's good. Obviously, that's better than not doing benchmarking at all. But I'd also suggest that are, there are times when you might want to visualize your benchmarks. This particular slide I'm showing you here uh, is uh, something we use to visualize some of the behavior. But I want to point out, we've been using Moss largely as I've described it to you today for several months and didn't know we had a problem, right? Everything seemed to behave correctly. The data was all there, performed OK. But when we added some team members and they started doing these visualizations, we'll zoom in a little bit. In that top chart, the blue is us writing some key value data. The red sawtooth pattern is the compaction. And generally, what we were seeing was you get some actual work done, a compaction happens. You get some more work done, compaction happens. But what we found was like it appears we did two compactions and like got no real work done. What was, what was going on there? And we probably stared at it for 20 minutes before someone with better eyes than me realized, no, we actually do have a very small bump of data there, right? It appears that what happened was we got one key value pair written out, and then the compaction copied over the whole file again. Now, if you're new to the game, right, that's not a good property for your key value store to have. Um, but it does show the process, right? We're starting with these really simple things, and we're reusing code wherever we can, and that's a really good process to have, but it sometimes leads to these unintended consequences, right? This is sort of like the sum of a bunch of, se of very simple decisions have led us to this really simple compactor, which has this unfortunate property, right? But that's the next part of the process, is doing the analysis, doing the benchmarking to figure out which parts you need to iterate on. And so I'd like to close with just a few conclusions. Oftentimes, when a new key value store is announced, you see a chart like this one that shows Moss up and to the right at some unbelievably exponential curve. Uh, and the competition, that gray line just speaks for itself. You might see tweets like, Moss is the best, fastest, hashtag winning. Competition is slow, sad. <laughs> but as engineers, we have to reject this kind of analysis, right? Words like best and fastest they just don't have any real meaning without the appropriate context, right? We're always considering trade-offs. We're always considering the use case. There's just no shortcut to that, right? What we, instead, what we can say is, we think what we've built is actually well-suited for the problem that we set out to solve. And there's no shortcut, right, to really doing a benchmark and understanding your use case and your workload before we would ever suggest considering that. But deeper, the process we followed, right, and this, this relates back, if you saw Peter's talk earlier, there's a very similar theme here. This notion of starting with a very simple implementation, being willing to benchmark it, analyze those results, look at profiles, and then only when you have a reason to enhance a particular component, then do you go back and you make that more complicated. This is a process that everyone in the room can apply to what they're working on. Now, it's an honor for me to be on stage talking about Moss today, uh, but much of the original work of Moss was done by my colleague, Steve Yen. Uh, he was far too modest and would not let me put his picture on the slide. Uh, we settled on the Mad Hatter as a compromise. And it's a bit of a cliche, but the project that's up on GitHub today is actually done by a team of engineers at Couchbase that have all made contributions to the project. So with that, if there's uh, interest in this sort of project, I'd certainly encourage you to go to GitHub and check out the project. Feel free to reach out to me by email or by Twitter.